Hello, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where in the country you are. Uh, my name is Brett England. Uh, I'm going to be your host here today. Uh, and this is our webinar on back to work, making sure your facility is ready around your emergency shower and eye wash equipment, uh, being compliant with uh, ANSI Z368.1, as well as some other key information. Um, we are going to go ahead here and get going. Uh, so that we are able to keep us on time. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping things real quick. Uh, we have everyone on mute, uh, obviously. We only have 30 minutes, and we really appreciate you giving us 30 minutes of your time. Uh, so if you have questions, we will address them at the end. Uh, you should have a chat box to the right where you should be able to type in your questions, and we will address them there uh, once we are at the end of the, the webinar. We will also share uh, some information with all the attendees. We'll be sending out an email afterward with some uh, key resources for you all. And at the end of the presentation, uh, I will have uh, contact information for both myself uh, and for uh, some other folks within the organization to share with you, as well as some links on where you can go to find some more information. Uh, so hopefully we can make this topical and impactful for everybody. Uh, so, uh, with that, our topics here today uh, are obviously around uh, the ANSI standard uh, and how to meet it uh, during these kind of different times that we're in. Uh, and one of the big questions we've gotten from our customers has been, uh, you know, what changes are out there? Are there anything, is there anything different around the standard that we need to be aware of uh, here in the middle of a, a pandemic? Uh, and it's kind of a good news, bad news situation. Uh, we've talked to OSHA and we've talked to the Joint Commission uh, and asked them if there's changes in guidance or changes that they're they're supposed to uh, be communicating down to facilities. And the good news is there are no changes. Uh, the ANSI standard is the standard that we need to, to achieve. The bad news is uh, that there's a lot of different focuses out there right now. Everything from providing the correct PPE to, you know, associates in your facilities to providing the correct social distancing. So in the middle of all this going on, yes, you don't have to change your focus on emergency shower and eye wash equipment, but you do still have to meet it. So we wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking through some of the key basics around ANSI Z368.1 uh, and what that means to you. Now, we're not going to do a full-on uh, ANSI webinar. I would encourage you, if you're interested in getting into the, the nitty-gritty details around the ANSI standard, uh, to sign up for the Haas newsletter uh, at hawsco.com or to follow us on LinkedIn uh, and attend one of our in-depth ANSI uh, webinars. We can go through a bunch of information on that for you all. Uh, but we're going to give you a, a top-level uh, piece of information that you can use here today. We're also going to spend a little time talking through some key research that we've done and some common sense things that you can look for in your facilities today when you're out and about to see if you think you might have a problem. Maybe you think you do. Uh, we'll give you some things that you can look for and just spot visually if you're, you're in the facility on a regular basis to say, hey, do I have a problem? Do I need to dig a little deeper? Uh, then we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about HAWS services and how we can help you uh, with HAWS services uh, to be able to meet the ANSI standard uh, and maybe take something off your plate if you have a, a lot of other focuses in trying to make sure your facility is working properly during this time. We can talk about how, how services can help you. And then finally, we'll go through some of those resources that I mentioned right at the end and open it up to Q&A. So with that, let's go through and spend just a couple of quick minutes talking about the ANSI standard and why compliance matters. So we get this question quite a bit. Um, what is the difference between the OSHA standard and the ANSI standard? What do I need to meet? Uh, and the, the answer is really pretty clear. OSHA has a standard uh, around this is 1910.151C. Uh, and just real top level, it says that, hey, where the eyes and body of any person may be exposed to injurious or corrosive materials, you have to have the right facilities for a quick drench or flush of the eyes and body. It has to be within the work area and and be available for immediate emergency use. That's all they say. Uh, and so when facilities have gone back to OSHA and said, well, hey, help me out here. What do I need to do to make sure I'm meeting that standard? The OSHA has referred them to the ANSI standard, Z358.1. Uh, and this is a standard that's written by the International Safety Equipment Association. And it goes through all the definitions 
uh, for design, placement, uh, temperature, uh, proper functionality, dimensions, everything you would need to know for proper uh, emergency equipment function in a facility. So why is it important? Well, obviously, they're fines. Uh, if you've been on one of our webinars before, you might remember this slide, uh, but OSHA will fine for uh, lack of proper emergency shower and eye wash equipment. And they range everywhere from a couple thousand bucks up to the one that usually grabs everyone's attention, uh, the one for Transaxle LLC uh, up in New Jersey, which is $382,000. That's a big number. Uh, and OSHA has been increasing fines. Uh, they increased in 2016. Uh, they increased again in 2019. Uh, they say that they will continue increasing to kind of keep up uh, with increasing costs in the, in the workspace. Uh, so fines are definitely an issue. No one wants to get a fine. No one wants to get a penalty. However, we think there are more important reasons than just fines for why being compliant, the ANSI standard matters. Uh, from the perspective of someone that's on the floor in your facility, there's what happens when you're actually in an emergency situation. Uh, so proper first aid counts. It's that associates having a bad day. Uh, they're hurt, they're scared, they're, they're running to use a piece of equipment and they wanna make sure they're getting proper first aid. And proper first aid has a direct impact on the outcome for that associate. So this is information that comes from a University of Wisconsin School of Engineering study. Uh, in the case of acid burns, for people who receive proper first aid, uh, the percentage of them that received deep tissue burns from that acid burn was 12.5% if you got proper first aid versus 63% getting deep tissue burns if they did not get proper first aid. Uh, days in the hospital, right? So seven and a half days in the hospital on average for people who did get proper first aid versus over 20 days in the hospital if you did not get proper first aid. When you start talking about alkali burns, it gets even uh, a little more grim. Uh, mortality rate for people who don't get proper first aid jumps up over 20%. Uh, and the percentage of people who need skin grafts if they don't get proper first aid jumps up to 36%. So from the perspective of the person on the floor in your facility, making sure that they have access to proper functioning emergency equipment that will provide proper first aid in the case of an emergency has a real impact a demonstrable impact on the outcome that they will see from whatever that uh, recordable incident is. Not only are there impacts to the associate, but then there's obviously impacts to you as a facility as well. Um, eye injuries have a, a tremendous cost. So this is a, a number from OSHA uh, they provided a couple years back. So they estimate there's about $300 million a year in lost productivity, uh, treatment, and worker comp due to eye accidents. Uh, so not only are you dealing with costs from the associate being needing extra medical care and workers comp, there's a liability issue that's there too. Because not only is that associate, if they're involved in a, uh, a serious incident at work, going to have medical care and you have a lost productivity for being down and addressing that, there's also probably a liability side that uh, is involved with that because you know they're probably going to be talking to a lawyer uh, and talking about, hey, you know, do I have a case here? And so in these times when it can be hard to justify budget expenditures, we're all in the same boat trying to figure out how to keep our costs low because it's an uncertain time. Safety is a, a really good place to continue to invest. There's a real positive correlation between an investment in safety and a return on that investment. Uh, this Liberty Mutual ROI survey from 2009 found for every dollar invested in safety, there was a $4 return on investment. Uh, so when you start looking at things like avoiding negative outcomes of fines or increased downtime or workers' comp or liability, and you look at the return on investment uh, on safety, there's a real reason to be taking a look at making sure that you are compliant to the ANSI standard. So what are the significant testing requirements? And we're going to focus on testing requirements right now uh, to make sure that we're talking about the things that you need to be doing on a regular basis. Uh, so when we talk about testing requirements, the ANSI Z358.1 standard requires a weekly performance check of equipment. Okay, and really all you are doing is the easy test, the simple test. You want to make sure that water is flowing to the heads of the unit. Okay. If it's a combination unit that has a shower and an eye wash, it needs to be able to flow to both heads. 
it's just an eyewash only, you want to make sure water's flowing to the head of the eyewash. Uh, but you just want to make sure water is flowing. Does the unit work? That's the first thing to check. The second thing that you need to check is to make sure that you're flushing out any dead leg of water that is feeding that unit. And so what's dead leg? Dead leg that stagnant water that sits in the pipe running from the source to the outlet. Uh, and all sorts of stuff grows in there. Uh, we've seen all sorts of things, and we've gone out and inspected equipment in people's facilities, black water, green water, uh, stuff that smells really horrible. You want to make sure you flush all of that out of there. Because if you think about it, if someone has, uh, you know, skin abrasions or has a chemical burn on their face, the last thing that you want to do is expose them to a bunch of bacteria and biofilm-laden water as they're trying to get proper first aid. Now, we do get a question here frequently on portable units. If you have a lot of portable units in your facility, what do you have to do for that weekly check? Um, you don't have to go and run that portable unit every week. For a portable, all you want to do, if it's a tank-type unit, open up the unit, look inside. Do you have enough water in there? Is the water up to the fill line on the portable unit? Uh, make sure the water looks good. There's nothing growing in it, uh, nothing that looks bad. Uh, if it's a, a cartridge-type system, um, you want to make sure that that cartridge is, is in there, <laughs> that it hasn't expired, uh, and that it hasn't been punctured. So those cartridge units, when they get punctured and they start to run, uh, you have to replace it at that point. But that's all you have to do from a weekly inspection standpoint. Now, the ANSI Z358.1 standard does require a full yearly inspection. Now, this is different, right? So the, the weekly test is not a very difficult test to execute. The yearly test, though, this is going to be top to bottom, soup to nuts. Uh, you need to test every single element of that piece of equipment to make sure that they are fully in compliance to the standard. And that's going to be everything from where it's located to how it performs, the height of the outlet, uh, the orientation of those outlets. All of those things go into it. Uh, and now they've made some changes to the standard over time as well. Uh, the picture you see on the screen here, this is a uh, testing resource that we have available. Uh, it shows you the different tests based on the different types of equipment. In orange on this screen, uh, on this uh, test checklist, it shows you the changes. These changes are not grandfathered. So if you have an older unit uh, and it doesn't meet this, it's not in compliance as it's older, it has to meet the standard. So some of the key things that we bump into out there on a regular basis uh, is location, making sure the equipment is not blocked, uh, that it doesn't have an impediment to the, the equipment. Uh, in orange, you can see there on the screen, one of the changes they made in 2014 was changing the distance to the unit. So for the hazard to the unit, it's 55 feet uh, or 10 seconds. It used to just be 10 seconds. Um, I'm six foot one. My 10 second distance covered might be a little bit different than someone else's 10 second distance covered. So things like that that are in there. In the case of a combination unit, you need to be able to run both the shower and the eye wash at the same time. Uh, so that's uh, another key thing that needs to be tested. Uh, you need to be able to test the flow pattern of the water. And you need to be able to run the unit for a full 15 minutes as part of that annual test. Uh, that can be a challenge uh, in some facilities if you don't have drainage that's built in there to be able to handle that. A, a combination unit will put out over 300 gallons of water in a 15-minute period of time, uh, but the standard is clear that that test needs to occur. Uh, so we'll have this available for you after the call, this testing resource, uh, as well as um, uh, email contacts if you have questions about the testing itself. Uh, and then there's also uh, some testing tools that we have available that will be in that resource that we send out to you afterwards as well. But those are really the two tests. You need to make sure you're doing your weekly test. You need to make sure you're doing your annual test. The weekly test right now, obviously, extremely important, uh, especially if it's something that's been overlooked, making sure you catch back up to it. And then the annual test, uh, if it's been overlooked since we kind of ran into the pandemic situation back uh, right towards the beginning of the year, if you've not completed it, it needs to get done. Uh, so that it's uh, finished and complete as well. So with that, let's talk about uh, some research that we have that we'd like to share with you, as well as talking about some common sense uh, things that you can do in your facilities today to see if you have a problem. 
Okay. So the, the first thing is talking a little bit about what we see. So Haas has a, has a broad team of sales reps across the country. There's over 55 of them out there. Uh, we've sent them out over the last five years with a, a highly modified piece of software, and they go out and they will do emergency shower uh, and eye wash audits in facilities. Uh, and we've been in, actually, this is a little out of date. I think we've been in over a thousand facilities at this point and inspected over 20,000 different units. Uh, and if you just think back to what we were talking about, uh, this equipment is supposed to be checked both weekly and annually. And so you would think with that amount of testing going on, we'd find a high degree of compliance to the ANSI standard. But the reality is that 78% of the equipment we test is non-compliant to the standard for performance reasons. So it's not talking about missing a sign or missing a dust cap cover or missing a light bulb over the unit. From a performance standpoint, it just does not work properly. Now there's about 10% of them that are missing that sign or missing that dust cap cover. Uh, and only 12% of the units out there actually meet the standard. So we know there's an issue. So how can you tell if you have an issue in your facility? Take a look, it's the first thing. So each piece of equipment is supposed to have some sort of test tag or test record attached to it. As you walk around, just look, is it being filled out regularly? Are you seeing if you have multiple locations within your facility, do you see that test record being filled out consistently across all the locations or maybe only in a few locations? Um, I was in a facility not too long ago where you had different groups of maintenance people responsible for different pieces of equipment. And some areas was, were great. They were right on. You could see the weekly test. Uh, they were all written down on there and the equipment was in decent shape. And there's other areas where it was not. Uh, and you could tell that just by glancing at the test tag. Take a look at the equipment and what's in front of it and around it, you know, in front, side to side. If there's a lot of equipment that's parked in front of your emergency shower and eye wash equipment, there's a, a pretty good red flag that you might have a problem going on because people don't understand the, the standard or not living up to the standard. Other things to take a look at is uh, the actual uh, equipment itself. Is it dirty? Is it broken? Is it damaged? Uh, that's not necessarily a, a sign that they're doing regular testing on the equipment or that it is, is functioning properly. The other thing to do is you walk by a unit, trigger it. Run the eye wash. Does the water come out clear or does it come out dirty? If it's coming out dirty, then there's another good sample that even if you think your weekly testing is being done properly, it might not actually be because we're not flushing that dead leg and getting that old water out of there. Some other things that you can look at if you want to get a little bit deeper, run the unit a little bit longer. If you see the water come flying out of the eye wash nozzles, uh, like a high pressure hose, that's a, an issue of, of high line pressure, which would actually be a, an issue with meeting anti-compliance for non-injurious flow. The opposite, low flow, if you see the water coming out, it's not coming out high enough where you can actually wash your eyes, uh, then you don't have enough flow to meet the, the pressure requirements for the ANSI standard as well. And then you can look at things like flow pattern. Are you able to wash both your eyes at the same time? If you can't, then there's a good probability that you have a, an issue with the ANSI requirement for uh, being able to flush both eyes simultaneously. Uh, and then if you can, and this is always a little bit tough, especially if you don't have that drainage, if you have a combination unit with both a shower head and an eye wash, try to run them both at the same time and see if the eye wash stays running properly when you trigger the shower. Uh, and that speaks to the simultaneous flow requirement as part of the ANSI Z358.1 standard. And then there's a couple of other things that you can look for when you're out on the floor of your facility. Just take a look at what type of equipment is there. If you see eye wash only equipment near chemical splash hazards, that's a question mark. Do you have the right type of equipment for the hazard that's present? Uh, you know, an eye wash only is, is going to get out any contaminant that goes directly into your eyes, but it's not going to flush anything off your face. And if there's a chemical splash, there's a very real likelihood that you're going to get chemicals all over your face, not just only in your eyes. Uh, and then the last one is tempering. Uh, depending on where you are in the country, tempering may or may not be an issue. Uh, one of the things that does come up on tempering is you have people say, well, hey, my lines are exposed in my facility uh, and the ambient air temperature, even in the winter, 
is 70 degrees in here, and so I'm fine. I don't need tempering. But what they don't stop to think about, especially if you're dealing with combination units, is you are pouring so much water through that unit that you exhaust that ambient air temperature water that's in the run going to that unit pretty quickly. So just understanding what your groundwater temperature is to know if you have a tempering issue or not. Uh, that's if you get a little more in depth into what you're taking a look at. So with that, what are some of the root causes for these issues, right? We, we talked a little bit about the, the scope of the problem. We talked about how you can check to see without going too in depth if you ha might have a problem in your facility. Well, I mean, the, the first one is it's seldom used equipment, especially right now. Uh, you know, we don't have as much maintenance on this equipment uh, as we would like to because there's a lot of other focuses for the maintenance department and a lot of facilities, uh, and it's a low priority. These are the root causes that go into some of the challenges that we see there, but based on the guidance coming back from both OSHA and Joint Commission, that's not going to fly. We have to be able to meet the standard. So what are some things that you can do then to address some of this? Uh, if you think you have a problem in your own facility while still being able to, to meet the demands you have today, well, this is where our Hawes Services group comes into play. So this is something unique to Hawes. Uh, Hawes is the only major manufacturer of emergency shower and eye wash equipment in the market that has a in-house service group. So Hawes Services uh, is a business that we started several years back. We cover the entire United States. They are Hawes employees, uh, and they're technical people. Uh, our our Hawes services group are made up of highly technical uh, folks. Uh, they have naval backgrounds. They were all working on nuclear power plants in the Navy. Uh, the fellow that covers the Midwest is a fellow named Chris Newberry. He had over 10 years in the Navy uh, working on starting up, uh, maintaining, decommissioning nuclear reactors on aircraft carriers or Jim McGlaris down in Florida, uh, who has over 20 years uh, in the Navy working on similar types of equipment. Uh, they're very good at understanding what is required for emergency shower and eye wash equipment uh, and how to fix and maintain this. So it's a great resource. We talked a little bit about some of the, the negative outcomes that are here and the return on your investment on spending on health and safety. Uh, and Harvest Services really fits within that bucket because they would be able to come in and help you make sure you've got functionality and compliance uh, on your emergency shower and eye wash equipment. One of the questions we get quite frequently about Hawes Services, well, it's only Hawes. What if I have other brands in my facility? And the great thing about our Hawes Services group is that they work on any brand. It is not only just Hawes. They are our subject matter experts around emergency shower and eye wash equipment first and are able to help you make sure that you're compliant. So what services they can provide? Uh, the first one, obviously, uh, annual ANSI inspections, they can do that. But we found quite a bit of interest from customers looking at repair and upgrade. These are customers, we know we have a problem. We kind of talking before about common sense things you can look for as you walk around your facility. We know we have a problem. We want to make sure we fix that problem. Hot services can come in and do that. They can do preventative maintenance. They can do startup and commissioning on new units to make sure that any new equipment you were to put in works properly. They can even do competent inspector training to help teach your folks how to inspect this equipment. Some of the customers we've done uh, service contracts with, some pretty big names that are out there whether it is hospital facilities like MD, Anser, MD Anderson Cancer Center down in Texas or Sinclair Oil out in Wyoming, PepsiCo, Panasonic, uh, Franciscan Health here in the Chicagoland area, uh, you name it, there's no type of facility that Hawes Services can't go in and work on. And just why should you take a look at a third party? We mentioned it before, everyone's busy. This is a good way to make sure you're ANSI compliant without having to divert your own resources to do it. Some other good places to look for using a third party services provider. If you've got multiple brands, uh, there's a facility that I was in uh, a couple of years ago, over 120 different pieces of emergency equipment and every major brand was represented. You had Hawes, Guardian, Bradley, um, Encon, Speakman, it was all there. That's a bear for the service team or the maintenance team to be able to stay on top of. Uh, if you have high opportunity costs, diverting your maintenance team away from whatever their primary function is to work on this equipment is going to yield lots of downtime. Uh, that's a, a great opportunity to look at third party 
if you have previous issues or you think you have a problem, kind of like we were talking about, third party is a great way to address it. Uh, and then if you're just in a big facility with lots of assets, going third party can really help you out in that situation as well. So a couple of things that are here, just as far as resources are concerned. The first is weekly and annual inspections. That checklist that I showed you before is available on cause.com. Uh, and we will also send you out an email at the end that has that checklist on it. So you have something there that you can refer back to. Uh, if you're interested in training your own folks on proper inspection uh, of this equipment, we do have an online training course. You go to hosco.com slash services and click on the training link. It will take you there. It's $100 per person. It's self-directed online training. You get a certificate upon the completion of it. If you have questions about ANSI compliance, uh, we have a lot of resources on hosco.com at our ANSI Resource Center. Uh, if you want more information about services, we have a link there to the services group. Uh, and if you ever have any questions, you can obviously go to HAWS services or email HAWS services at HAWSCO.com with specific questions about that. Uh, and so now we've got a few minutes here real quick because it wouldn't be a webinar without a poll question. Uh, Nicole, if you could go ahead. We do have a poll question here we'd like you to, to ask. We'll leave that open here for a second. And then we'll open it up to questions. By the way, my contact information is listed below. If you have any questions that you think of afterwards, you want to reach out, please feel free to reach out to myself uh, or the services team. We're happy to answer those questions. And we'll see if we have any questions here. Nicole, do you see any questions that are on your end? Because otherwise, I am right up on our time. No, I think um, the the couple questions that have have come in is just really speaking to um, with the COVID situation that we've been dealing with. Can you just just kind of hone in on that real quick and just really what is still required if there's been any waivers um, or if any, again, if we fall into any, um, um, excuse me, waivers basically on requirements as of late? Good, good question, no. So in talking to uh, OSHA, obviously we have folks within OSHA that we speak to on a regular basis and then also on the healthcare world, Joint Commission, we've reached out to both organizations to ask if there are changes, waivers, uh, other modifications to uh, compliance for emergency shower and eye wash equipment that we need to be aware of. Uh, and the statement back is no. Uh, you know, you must meet the, the requirements as laid out uh, currently. Uh, which is uh, the OSHA requirement uh, recommendation you follow ANSI Z358.1, uh, and the same goes for Joint Commission as well. So there's no waivers, no changes. Uh, you need to meet the existing standards. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's the, the key point here is it's business as usual. Uh, as, as, as it doesn't look like business as usual from an operation standpoint, from a safety standpoint, testing is still required. And there's a lot of, there could be a lot of confusion around that. So thank you for the clarification. Sure, great. Well, that takes me right up to our 30 minutes. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much and have a good rest of your day.